Okay, I'm going to go over some of the concepts required to understand what's going on when you run a simulation and what are the kinds of things we can read off of the simulation report that we get from this add-in simboy. We could, so let's look over here first. We could build a model of a business situation and even though some of our inputs are random or they have some variability, we have a choice to say, well, why don't we just input the mean or the most likely value? Let's say we have one random input to this model. And I want to make it simple. I want to just say, I'm going to input the mean, see what the model says. And let's say the output we're looking at is profit. So for example, and we look at this number and say, this looks good, and we could proceed that way. Now, the whole point of this class, particular simulation class, is to say that this is a terrible idea. And I'm going to try to explain why, but there is a very nice explanation of all of this in the Harvard Business Review article that I posted under course documents, right above where um, the syllabus is. Okay. So imagine that if you do this, you're essentially taking an input that could be several different things. And some of those input numbers could be very high, some of them could be very low, and some of them could appear more frequently, some of them could appear more infrequently. You can think of demand, for example, right, for a product. And you're essentially throwing all of that knowledge that you have about the number away. And using a single number to represent all of that knowledge. And there's no way that this output is going to capture all of the information that you would need to be able to make a good decision in this situation. So instead of doing one in, one out, what we really want to do is many in, many out. And here's the idea. Even though we know the input is a little random, we normally have some idea for how random it is. Um, we can look at past history, we can try to forecast a few things and have a feeling for the ranges of values, the likelihoods of values that are coming out of this uh, randomness that is getting fed into our model. So for demands, we could know uh, it's usually not less than this or not more than this. It's somewhere in between these numbers. Uh, is it more or less symmetric or not, right? And that's when all those different distributions that you guys learn in the statistics course uh, can help. So there is Poisson distribution, there is exponential distribution, there is normal distribution, and so on. Binomial. And these distributions, they have different shapes. So this one is a little bell, but it's a, a bell that's a little, um, you know, pushed to the left-hand side, so it's not fully symmetric. And other distributions have other shapes. The exponential begins high and then goes down like this. And different distributions model different things better or worse. Uh, the example I gave in class is the, the exponential distribution is good if the input you're trying to model is, for example, uh, the amount of time it takes a doctor to see a patient or the amount of time it takes to serve somebody who comes into a fast food restaurant. Uh, the Poisson distribution is good to model things like the quantity of events that take place within a certain time window. So if I am looking at a toll booth, how many cars go through the toll booth um, in every hour, right? It's a count. I'm counting that over a fixed time window. And if I have a collection of events, each of them can turn out to be yes, no. For example, I am looking at passengers who booked a ticket and some of them will be no shows. So there's a chance for each passenger. Will they show? Will they not show? And what I want to know is out of a group of, let's say 50, how many will not show up if each person has a likelihood of, let's say, 80% of showing up. This would be a binomial distribution. So there are several things that occur commonly enough 
that there exist distributions to model their behavior. And if you go to the manual of our simulation program, it lists for you the distributions it can use as inputs for your simulation model and gives examples of situations where you would use each of them. So going back here, given what you know about your random inputs, you choose an appropriate distribution for them. And what does that do? Well, what we can ask the simulation software to do is the following. We can say, don't feed one number to my model to get one number out. I want you to go into this distribution and take out what are called trials, as in pick n, where n is typically a large number in thousands or so, and randomly selected numbers from this universe of potential inputs, let's say demands, and feed each of them one at a time into this model. For each of those that you input, I'm going to have a corresponding output. So if I feed a thousand demand values to this model, I'm going to have a thousand profit values coming out on the other side. Then what can I do with this large quantity of outputs? I can basically plot a histogram for it. Imagine that this is horizontal axis is my profit and the vertical axis is how many times did you see that number show up when you were running this model over and over and over with these random inputs. And let's say each of these little dots are indicating how often I saw that come out as a profit result. So now having this spread or distribution of my outputs is significantly more informative than having a single one. Why? Well, it's because out of this histogram I can extract a lot of information. Let's go over here. I could look at it and say, what is the average value of my output? Let's say my average or my expected profit. What would be the standard deviation of these outputs, right? What is the smallest number you ever see? What is the largest number you ever see? And because I have this histogram, I can also calculate percentiles, right? If you guys don't remember what percentiles are, percentile is the point at which a certain percentage of the probability, right, below that, so it's from that point to the left, there is so much probability, so much chance that I'm going to see results there. So the median is what's known as a 50th or 50% percentile because that is the point at which half of your numbers are to the left and the other half are to the right. So for example, if this is my um, histogram of outputs of the simulation, so dollar signs on the horizontal axis, I find wherever the number zero is and I count how many of my outputs, what proportion of my outputs are to the left of the zero, that proportion will be a percentile and I can say, okay, this is the chance that I'm going to lose money if I do whatever this model is representing, right? The proportion of my outputs that had a less than zero outcome. I could also look at the other side of this and say, how often, right, when I ran my model many, many times, how often did you see a number that was super nice and high? Let's see, above $100,000 that proportion of the outcomes is going to be a good estimator for the likelihood that you're going to make over that much money when you do whatever this model is trying to represent. And if you think that this proportion of negative outcomes is too high, that could be an indication to you that the risks involved are too high. We should probably modify something or do something different. And likewise, maybe you were expecting that this endeavor would have a high chance of making a lot of money, but in the end you realize, you know what, it's just a 10% chance I'm going to cross the threshold I wanted. Maybe this is not worth it, or perhaps we should change some of our parameters to increase those chances, right? So this is the idea of the simulation. Many inputs create many outputs. And when I have many outputs, I can start to have a better feel for how likely certain things are to happen. 
um, great. One other thing we're going to need and we're going to use is the idea of confidence intervals. Now, imagine that I take, let's say, a thousand trials, a thousand different inputs, and I get one of these histograms. Out of this, I could calculate an average, right? My expected profit. Now, let's say that I do this, and I take this average, right? Here you go. So I ran my simulation one time, simulation one. I got this histogram of outputs, I calculate an average. Now, because the simulation is randomized, if I go back and run it again, I will see some other collection of outputs because the inputs will be different. They're still coming from the same distribution, but because they're random numbers coming from that distribution, they're going to be different. That means if I run my simulation a second time, simulation 2, when I compute my average, it's not going to necessarily match the first one. And I could do this over and over and over again. Imagine if I did that. If you take these averages that you're calculating and plot a histogram of them, okay, so don't confuse. This first histogram is the histogram of the outputs that I get when I feed my model. From this histogram, I could compute an average. And if I create several of those histograms because I ran my simulation several times, I will have several average values. If I take those guys and make a histogram of them, that's the whole point of the central limit theorem. A histogram of averages of these simulation outruns will indeed have a bell-shaped form. It will approach a normal distribution. Even if the histogram of each individual simulation run does not. Okay, so regardless of what the shape of this one is, the shape of the one that is the histogram of the averages will be a normal bell curve. In what way is that helpful? It's helpful in the sense that now I can calculate a confidence interval around this average to say, okay, I believe, instead of saying, I believe the average is this X bar, I'm going to say, I believe the average is between this number and that number, and I am 95% confident that that is true which means if I run 100 of these simulations in 95 of them, the answer will lie inside this interval. So how do we calculate a confidence interval for the mean? It goes like this. You take the mean value that you got out of one of these runs, right? And out of these runs, remember, you are going to get a standard deviation, right? Which is the spread of these numbers here, but what you want to be able to draw or to compute the confidence interval is the standard deviation of the mean. Notice these are two different things. I don't know that. There is the standard deviation of the mean and then there's standard deviation of these values here that you use to calculate the mean. Okay, so in the simulation output when you see the output that is called standard deviation, that is the standard deviation of these values. But there's going to be one output there that is called the mean standard error. And that guy is just another name for the standard deviation of the mean value. So now if you recall from your stats class, the 95% confidence interval is the mean plus or minus 1.96 times the standard deviation of the mean. Okay, If you wanted a 99% confidence interval, the number is going to be more or less 2.57. All right, great. This number here can be obtained with the Excel function norm synv of this value here. Why 0.975? It's because of the following. This function here says the following, 
how many standard deviations do I have to go away from the mean, let's say to the right, so that when I draw a line vertical here, when I have my cursor, to the left of that vertical line, I have this much probability. Well, if I want a 95% confidence interval, it means I throw away 2.5% on the right and 2.5% on the left. That means when I go to the rightmost limit here, the cutoff, the amount of probability that I have to the left is 97 and a half, right? Because I have two and a half to the right. So norm zinv with the input 97.5% gives you the distance between the mean and that place, how many standard deviations it is. And in this case of the 9.75 is 1.96 approximately. All right, great. So we're going to use these ideas when we do the actual simulation run in Excel. Let's go there.